On Monday, as we entered the third week of illegal blockades and occupations, the federal government invoked the Emergencies Act. We did it to protect families and small businesses, to protect jobs and the economy. We did it because the situation could not be dealt with under any other law in Canada. Mr. Speaker, we did it because that's what responsible leadership requires us to do. For the good of all Canadians, the illegal blockades and occupations have to stop and the borders have to remain open. We've made progress since Monday. On Tuesday, the border was reopened in southern Alberta after the Coots blockade was dismantled. The RCMP arrested a small group of people within the larger blockade and seized firearms, ammunition and body armor. It is believed that this group was willing to use force against police officers. On Wednesday, the blockade in Emerson, Manitoba had been cleared without arrests or charges. Traffic and trade at this border crossing have now resumed. In Windsor, Mayor Dilkins said law enforcement was able to successfully intercept a new convoy suspected of heading to the Ambassador Bridge. And here in Ottawa, law enforcement now has more tools and resources in order to give the people of this city their jobs, neighbourhoods and freedoms back. À Windsor, à Coutts et à Emerson, les barrages illégaux ont été In Windsor, Coutts and Emerson, we had illegal actions and border crossings resumed. I would like to thank the police for their work. This includes members of the RCMP who worked on site. For the good of the economy, families and workers, it is now time for these dangerous illegal activities to stop. That includes those here in Ottawa. Mr. Speaker, invoking the Emergencies Act is not something that we take lightly. This is never the first option, neither the second or third. It is a last resort. When I consulted with the provincial and territorial premiers on Monday, I was very clear. By blocking supply chains, the illegal barricades are considerably harming our economy and all Canadians. Consistent with the requirements of the Emergencies Act, that the views of the premiers of all provinces and territories be carefully considered, and that is what we did. And the consultation and collaboration with the premiers will continue until the situation is resolved. Like I said on Monday, the scope of the Emergencies Act is time-limited and targeted, as well as reasonable and proportionate. It strengthens and supports law enforcement agencies so they have more tools to restore order and protect critical infrastructure. These illegal blockades are being heavily supported by individuals in the United States and from elsewhere around the world. We see that roughly half of the funding that is flowing to the barricaders here is coming from the United States. The goal of all measures, including financial measures in the Emergencies Act, is to deal with the current threat only and to get the situation fully under control. Mr. Speaker, I want to reassure Canadians that when the Emergencies Act is invoked, the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms continues to protect their individual rights. We're not using the Emergencies Act to call in the military. We're not limiting people's freedom of expression. We're not limiting freedom of peaceful assembly. We're not preventing people from exercising their right to protest legally. We are, in fact, reinforcing the principles, values and institutions that keep all Canadians free. The blockades and occupations are illegal. They're a threat to our economy and relationship with trading partners. 
They're a threat to supply chains and the availability of essential goods like food and medicine. And they're a threat to public safety. The Emergencies Act will be time limited and targeted to address threats from illegal occupations and blockades only. The measures are reasonable and proportional. And I want to make it clear for Canadians, Mr. Speaker, when the Emergencies Act is invoked, the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms continues to protect individual rights. We do not use the Emergencies Act to deploy the military. We do not suspend fundamental rights. We don't restrict freedom of expression or the right to peaceful protest. What we want is to keep Canadians safe, protect workers' jobs, and restore confidence in our institutions. Mr. Speaker, we understand that everyone is tired of this pandemic. We understand that Canadians are frustrated with COVID. Some protesters came to Ottawa to express their frustration and fatigue with public health measures, and that's their right. Like I said, it's a right that we'll defend in this free and democratic country. But illegal blockades and occupations are not peaceful protests. They have to stop. We are all looking forward to the end of the pandemic. Public health measures are constantly being reevaluated, and we will continue to modify them based on science and the situation. And we will continue to encourage vaccination. This week, based on advice from public health experts, Health Minister Duclos announced that we'll soon, soon start easing border measures for travellers. Our government, the health minister... Uh, if, I can, if, I can interrupt the, if, I, if I can interrupt the Prime Minister for a second, we need, we need, we need to make sure we're not using proper names in here, so we want to stick to the writing, the writing names. The, honorable, the right honourable Prime Minister. This week, based on advice from public health experts, the health minister announced that we'll soon start easing border measures for travellers. Our government will continue to follow the best scientific advice to keep Canadians safe and support health care workers. People are making sacrifices and have been for two years. It's never time to hurt our communities or our fellow Canadians with illegal blockades, but especially not now that we're reopening and beginning to get back to the things we love. That's why, Mr. Speaker, it is so important for us to be having this debate today and in the days to come, and for Parliament to play its role in this process. Today, I ask all members of this House to take action against illegal blockades that are harmful to Canadians. I ask all members of this House to stand up for families and workers, to stand up for jobs and our economy, and to stand up for the freedom of Canadians and for public safety. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Questions and comments. And comments, and we'll try our, our best to get all parties represented during, during this one. The Honourable Member for Surgeon River Parkland. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Prime Minister, the Minister of Public Safety, and the Minister for Emergency Preparedness have repeatedly stated that there is evidence of foreign extremist financing behind this convoy. Last week at Public Safety Committee, Deputy Director of Intelligence for FinTrack, Barry McKillop, stated that there is no evidence that this funding in Ottawa is tied to ideologically motivated extremism. Under further questioning, he stated that there has been no spike in suspicious transactions. Under what basis is this government freezing the bank accounts of Canadians in violation of Section 8 of the Charter against unreasonable search and seizure? Here, here. 
The President Honorable Prime Minister. The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Speaker, I think it is going to be extremely important that uh, in this House over the coming days there will be uh, Im uh, a important and robust debate on many such issues. But I can highlight once again, Mr. Speaker, that the Charter of Rights and Freedoms continues to apply. Uh, the Emergencies Act is uh, subject to the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, and the measures that we've brought forward are proportional, measured, and responsible, uh, and uh, designed to get Canadians their lives back, their communities back, and restore their freedoms. Questions and comments. The Honourable Member for Belle Chambly. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I think that roughly everyone agrees about the intent, namely to end the siege in Ottawa, which is almost the only hostile protest that is still active here. If the intent is fine, but while it is, the means to achieve the end is not. If Quebec had ended protests, well, they did without the Emergencies Act. They opened the border without using the Act, and arms were seized without the Emergency Measures Act. And the Ambassador's Bridge was reopened without the Emergencies Act. And there are other situations that were solved without this Act. How come the Prime Minister say that there's no other means to intervene? And how come he cannot exclude the other provinces, such as Quebec, who do not want to be subject to the use of the Emergencies Act. The Right Honourable Prime Minister, police forces in jurisdictions across the country now have more tools at their disposal to tackle these blockades and illegal occupations when and if they are needed. And they will continue, we will continue to make sure that measures are proportional and reasonable and limited in time. But it is important to give more tools to our police officers who need them. We understand that in many parts of the country, they were able to properly control the situation, but the Emergencies Act applies across the country, will only be used, though, when it is necessary. Questions and comments? Question et commentaire, the Honourable Member for Burnaby South. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. For weeks, this occupation was allowed to continue. People lost their wages. Citizens were harassed. The potential for violence grew. And the federal government, instead of acting, argued over jurisdiction. So what responsibility does the Prime Minister take for the inaction that made the Emergencies Act necessary? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, I appreciate the opportunity to reiterate that from day one of these uh, barricades and blockages and occupations, the federal government has been uh, supplying resources and working closely with local police of jurisdictions to ensure that they had the tools that they needed. Obviously, this situation has evolved, this situation has escalated, but every step of the way, the federal government has been there to support uh, the law enforcement of jurisdiction here in Ottawa. That means the Ottawa Police Services and the OPP, and we will continue uh, to be there with the RCMP as necessary. Time for about a 15-second question and answer. The Honourable Member for Ottawa Centre. Thank you very much, uh, Speaker. As uh, you very much are aware that my riding includes Parliament Hill, which has been under siege for over three weeks now, Speaker. My community has been held hostage, and I can t assure you that these protests have not been peaceful or lawful. My question to the Prime Minister is, how is this Emergencies Act is going to help my constituents in Ottawa Centre? The Honourable Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker. Uh, Canadians continue to have the right to free expression, the right to protest peacefully, but occupying the downtown uh, of, uh, of our major cities, uh, protesting and blocking uh, border crossings is unacceptable. That is why we have given more tools in a proportional way to police officers. Sure. Reprise du debat, continuing debate, the Honourable Minister of Public Safety. Um, Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I'd like to uh, begin by thanking the Prime Minister for um, uh, commencing this important debate on the invocation of the Emergencies Act uh, for the first time. 
And I want to begin with um, um, a number of expressions of gratitude, both uh, to my colleagues, to my colleagues on this side of this house. I'd also like to uh, begin by expressing my gratitude to the opposition uh, for uh, the informed debate which we're about to have. And finally, Mr. Speaker, I'd like to thank Canadians um, because I know that this has been a very difficult time, a period of great frustration and anxiety and uncertainty, and it is not lost on me, and I hope not on all members of the chamber, that the confluence of events of the pandemic and now these illegal blockades does create for an emotionally charged atmosphere. And sometimes we let that get the better of us here in this chamber, but my sincere hope is that we'll be able to have a principled debate about why it is that the government has chosen to invoke the Emergencies Act, the paramount reason being the health and safety of all Canadians. Now, you've heard the Prime Minister set out um, what the test uh, for the invocation of the Emergencies Act is. And I know that uh, my colleague, the Minister of Justice and the Attorney General and other members uh, will uh, elaborate on that. But I want to focus uh, my comments on what I believe are uh, the perceived and real risks to public safety that we have seen over the last number of weeks, uh, which emanated from the so-called uh, Freedom Convoy. Now, this convoy uh, has been uh, taking to uh, the streets right across the country and at other critical uh, infrastructure, including our borders, our national symbols, our communities, our neighbourhoods, and it has had a profound impact. And I would submit to you, Mr. Speaker, and to members of this chamber, a very negative and detriment detrimental impact to public safety. I want to touch on a number of the ports of entry uh, which uh, have been interrupted significantly as a result of the participation of those uh, in the illegal blockades, including at Coots in Alberta, Emerson in Manitoba, Surrey, British Columbia, uh, Windsor, Ontario, Sarnia, Ontario, Fort Erie, Ontario, as well as here in Ottawa. Um, I hope that all members would recognize that the kind of conduct that we have seen at our borders puts into question, into serious question, the integrity and the security of this country. The impact at Coots, for example, has cost the economy approximately $48 million per day in Emerson, $73 million a day, and in Windsor, where we conduct nearly um, or roughly a quarter of all of our daily trade with our most important trading partner in the United States, roughly $390 million. Now, those are just numeric figures, but I think about the translation of those dollar figures into the impact on Canadians' jobs, on families, on those who are just trying to get by right now. And whatever the motivation of uh, some individuals who uh, have, have, have commingled with, with those organizers and agitators of this illegal blockade, whatever their uh, concerns are with regards to the government's um, strategy to get out of the pandemic, which of course is to get vaccinated, um, it has become something much, much more concerning. Um, now, Mr. Speaker, I, I do want to say that um, we have made some progress at these ports of entry, and that is in large part thanks to the very important work uh, that has been undertaken by um, the members of our law enforcement. I would like to thank the RCMP for their efforts and energy, all police forces, in fact, they're doing good work on the ground. There's a lot of progress being made. Most of our borders are now open, and that is good for our economy and for trade. And it's also good for Canadians. But this progress, it's not a given. That we continue to uh, guarantee um, the progress that we have made. I want to speak for a moment about the situation here in Ottawa, and I know that um, many of my colleagues in the NCR caucus have um, spoken very articulately and very passionately uh, about the, the damage that has been caused in our communities and our neighbourhoods. Mr. Speaker, I've heard some members uh, on the opposition side uh, try to uh, somehow cast uh, a, a minimization, uh, uh, some, some kind of effort to um, generalize what is going on outside of this chamber as being legitimate. It is not, Mr. Speaker. It's illegal, and it causes great harm. We've seen people intimidated, harassed, 
been threatened. We've seen apartment buildings uh, that have been chained up. We've seen fires set in the corridors. Um, uh, residents are terrorized. Yeah. And it is absolutely gut-wrenching uh, to see the sense of abandonment and helplessness that they have felt now for weeks. And I want to assure them that since day one that the federal government has done everything that it could to provide additional resources. The RCMP has sent um, three, uh, three uh, sets of reinforcements to the Ottawa Police Service and will continue to do whatever we can to help. But it is also important, I think, for members of this chamber to recognize that we here, we write the laws, we set the policies, but we trust our police, our law enforcement, to enforce them. And that is why it is so important um, that we use every tool in our box, especially now, uh, where we find ourselves in a predicament, in a dilemma, in a situation that has uh, perhaps never been seen before. Now, I ask myself, Mr. Speaker, and I hope others are reflecting as well, what's this all about? And trying to step back and looking at you know, what it is that, that that's occurring. Um, and I'm concerned. I, I've heard some people say and still say that this is a, a protest about vaccines. It's not. Or that it's a protest about mandates. It is not. I've heard some people say still that this is a protest about freedom. Mr. Speaker, what is going on outside in the streets of Canada at our borders is most certainly not about freedom. Absolutely, Absolutely. not. It is not about freedom. It is about a very small, organized and targeted group of individuals who are trying to strip away the very freedoms that we here, here have here. sworn to uphold. Exactly. Here, here. That are that the generations of those who uh, preceded us have sworn to uphold, Mr. Speaker. Now, I've seen many striking similarities in the way that these blockades have manifested across uh, the country. The tactics that they are using, the timing in which they are occurring, the targets, uh, whether they are national symbols um, like, this, uh, like, like the parliament here or provincial legislatures, like the war monument outside, where we hear members speak passionately about their forebearers who went and made the sacrifices for the freedoms that we now enjoy. The individuals outside are tearing down the barriers to attack those monuments. Now what does that say? Those are those are those are those are those are going. I know members are, are heckling, but I'm encouraging them to to reflect. And also the rhetoric, Mr. Speaker, and yes, the rhetoric and yes and yes, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker. Notwithstanding the efforts of my colleagues to try to shout me down, I'm speaking here on behalf of constituents and Canadians, Mr. Speaker. And yes, there is an ideologically motivated um, operation that, 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 that we see in the rhetoric here that is meant to incite. And that is indeed one of the reasons why, Mr. Speaker, that we have chosen, that we've had to invoke the Emergencies Act. Now, I want to assure members that these are very targeted measures that they are time-limited, that they are uh, protected and bound by the Charter. And for those who want to ask questions as to how those powers are going to be enforced, part of the debate is going to ensure that there are the sufficient guardrails and safeguards in place. There will be transparency on how those measures are implemented. There will also be an inquiry to be, uh, to be, to be sure so that we can learn from these lessons and make sure that this is a, an instrument that has been used responsibly and in a manner that is consistent with the Charter to uphold the health and safety of all Canadians, Mr. Speaker. Now, at the end of the day, um, we're all here, uh, I, I would hope, uh, to do one thing, and that is to protect the health and safety of Canadians. We find ourselves at a crossroads with the pandemic, but we've made progress. We've made progress with the pandemic, Mr. Speaker, and we are making progress in restoring public order. But it is absolutely imperative that we have these debates in a principled, in a reasonable manner that is respectful of our constituents, respectful of Canadians, and that is certainly something that I hope that we will see over the next number of days. Question a commentaire, questions and comments, the Honourable Member of Sturgeon River Parkland. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Minister today and in a news conference yesterday has repeatedly stated that there is an ideologically motivated violent extremist. There is a small group of extremists who are willing to use violence. He says that there are ties between extremists that were apprehended in coots and extremists here in Ottawa. But when asked repeatedly by the media to back up that assertion with evidence, the minister failed to provide any evidence. 
We are talking about invoking a once in 34 year emergencies act. Parliamentarians deserve real evidence, not conjecture from this minister before we can ever contemplate suspending the rights of Canadians. And what basis does this minister make to claim that there are violent extremists in Ottawa? The Honourable Minister. I want to thank my colleague for the question, and I'm afraid uh, he operates from the false premise that the Emergencies Act is any kind of suspension of, uh, of charter rights. It's not. As I've said throughout the course of the, of the debate, and as the Act itself says, that all of the powers that need to be exercised in the Emergencies Act must be done in accordance with the Charter. Mr. Speaker, that means ensuring that Section 8 is respected. That means which uh, protects people from the uh, right of... It, it guarantees the right to be protected from any unreasonable search and seizure, and same for Section 7 as well. Thank you. Oh, come on, Tara. Questions and comments. Uh, the Honourable Member for Avignon, Matisse, Matan, Matapidia. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. In the beginning of his speech, the minister said that he was proud for tabling this motion, proud of being the first minister of public safety to invoke the Emergencies Act since its application. How can he be proud of applying a law that will limit fundamental rights of Quebecers and Canadians? Uh, listening to the Prime Minister, he said it was the measure of last resort. Unfortunately, I don't think he used all the tools in the toolbox before getting to this point. I'd like to know what other actions could have been taken before they invoked the Emergencies Act. The Honourable Minister of Public Safety. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. As usual, I want to thank my colleague for her question. The Emergencies Act is a last resort. It is not the first option. It's not our preference. And that is why we added many resources since the beginning to help police forces restore order. Now we are at a very difficult time with many challenges, and that is why we introduced this measure. Thank you. Tara, questions and comments. The Honourable Member for London Fanshawe. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And um, uh, while I was listening to the Honourable Member's uh, speech, uh, he spoke of the people that are being impacted uh, by the blockades. Uh, he spoke about the harassment and the assaults. And, and I know I've spoken to a lot of workers in this downtown about that as well. It's, it's, truly, it's truly heartbreaking. I think of the workers and the businesses that have been impacted negatively. I, I think about the people at the Rideau Centre. I think about people within my own region in southwestern Ontario and those businesses who have been impacted. But what is this government's plan to help those workers and those businesses after this debate is done, after we've, we've seen that the protesters have gone home, after everything? We've been asking for this government to, to come up with a plan. So what's the plan for those people after? The Honourable Minister of Public Safety. I thank my colleague for her question, and I share her concerns about public safety and uh, certainly the impact of these illegal blockades across the country uh, has not only undermined public safety, but it has impacted um, families' abilities and individuals' abilities to provide for themselves. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I want to assure my colleague that we will work with her and with all members so that once we clean up these illegal blockades and we have public safety restored on the streets here in Ottawa, that, that the Government of Canada will continue to be there to support Canadians as we have been throughout the pandemic. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Reprise du débat, continuing de debate, the Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I will be splitting my time with the member for Mégantique-Lerable today. Speaker, this week, for the first time since its passage, the Emergencies Act has been invoked by the Prime Minister. This is historic and it is extremely disappointing. The Prime Minister has invoked the Act, he says, to deal with the protests that have gathered here in downtown Ottawa and blockades that were happening at the Coutts border in Alberta, the Emerson border in Manitoba, the Ambassador Bridge in Windsor and the border at Surrey. All of which, by the way, are now open. There are no more blockades at any borders. What's left are the trucks parked outside here in Ottawa that need to move or be moved. 
However, throughout the last three weeks, the Prime Minister has failed to take meaningful action to de-escalate the protests here or use any tools that he may have available. Instead, he has jumped straight to the most extreme measure. And as he has invoked the Act, he has failed to meet the high threshold set out by the Emergencies Act to justify it. That being, and I quote, when a situation seriously threatens the ability of the Government of Canada to preserve the sovereignty, security and territorial, territorial integrity of Canada, and when the situation cannot be effectively dealt with under any other law of the country. Conservatives do not believe the government has shown that threshold has been met and thus we will be voting against it. Here. Keep in mind, keep in mind, Mr. Speaker, this act is already invoked and is the new law of the land. Our debate and the vote on Monday can only stop it if the NDP vote with Conservatives and the Bloc to stop it. the most serious decisions a parliamentarian can make. I want to remind especially the NDP of this, who are supporting the Liberals in this sledgehammer approach. History will not be kind to the leader of the NDP or his members on this particular question. The Emergencies Act, the Emergencies Act predecessor, the War Measures Act, was only used three times, World War I, World War II and the FLQ crisis. Colleagues, we should keep these precedents in mind. The weight of those events should caution us against making this decision lightly. These protests have caused disruptions for many Canadians, especially local businesses and residents of Ottawa. As I have said, Conservatives are the party of law and order. We believe the trucks should move or be moved. to lower the temperature across the country. The Prime Minister clearly wants to raise it. Let's be very clear how this all started. The Prime Minister decided to impose a vaccine mandate on truckers with no scientific evidence that it was the right thing to do. Many Canadians opposed it, but he went ahead anyway. Truckers and millions of Canadians felt they had no recourse with this Prime Minister. And who can blame them? After all, this was the Prime Minister who called them racist and misogynist. He said their views were unacceptable, that they were on the fringe. And when truckers and their supporters arrived in Ottawa, what did the Prime Minister do first? He hid for a week and then he continued his insults, calling them and anyone who supported them or even talked with them things like Nazi supporters. We saw that name calling and unfair and mean spirited characterization happen just yesterday, Mr. Speaker, by the Prime Minister of Canada in this House. That is all he has done to rectify the problem call names and insult. Mr. Speaker, many of the people that are protesting, many of the people who are upset are our neighbours. They are our constituents. They are Canadians. And they want to be heard and given even just a little respect by their Prime Minister. But the Prime Minister has decided that because he, dis he disagrees with them, doesn't like their opinions, he won't hear them. At every turn, the Prime Minister has stigmatised, wedged, divided and traumatised Canadians. And now, without even a single meeting with a trucker, without talking through one of their concerns, without apologizing for his insults and listening to what people have to say, without using any other tool at his disposable disposal, he has used this overreach, this Emergencies Act, and it's wrong. The Prime Minister's leadership in this situation has frankly been abysmal. He said this week, and I quote, invoking the Emergencies Act is never the first thing, thing a government should do, or even the second. The Act has to be used sparingly and as a last resort. But his actions have shown the opposite approach. The so-called measure of last resort has come before taking any action to address the frustrations at the root of the protest. How did the Prime Minister go directly from ignoring the truckers to turning the, into this to the Emergencies Act? Why is the government 
jump straight to this without doing anything to lower the temperature first. Conservatives put forward a reasonable approach that could help bring the temperature down and address the concerns. We asked the government to commit publicly to a specific plan and timeline to roll back federal mandates and restrictions, but the Liberals and NDP refused to support our plan, and instead the Prime Minister reached for more power. This comes as provincial governments are announcing plans to end COVID-19 restrictions. The Prime Minister is an exception to this trend and he refuses to come forward with a plan. Even the provinces are unhappy with the Prime Minister for doing this. Alberta, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, Quebec, Nova Scotia, they're all opposed to the use of the Emergencies Act. This is not a good look for the Prime Minister. We all want the trucks here in Ottawa to move. We want a peaceful and quick end to the trucks blocking the streets in Ottawa. Our message to those protesting is still this. Conservatives have heard you. We will keep standing up for you. But it's time to move the trucks. At the same at the same time, the government should resort, no government should resort to the kind of extreme measures that we're seeing. Unfortunately, the Prime Minister has a track record of serious disregard for the law, and that raises a lot of red flags. This is the Prime Minister who interfered with an ongoing criminal trial in the SNC-Lavalin scandal. This is a Prime Minister who took the Speaker to court instead of fulfilling his legal obligation to provide documents to this parliament. On two separate occasions, this is the Prime Minister who has been found guilty by the Ethics Commissioner. This Prime Minister admired, admitted his basic admiration for basic dictatorships. Red flag after red flag after red flag. He may not like it, Mr. Speaker, but in Canada, civil liberties must be defended at every turn. Section 2 guarantees our freedom of association and assembly. Section 7 guarantees our right to life, liberty and security of the person. Section 8 guarantees our protection against unreasonable search and seizure. Canadians can't be expected to simply take this Prime Minister at his word. His plans are not consistent with fundamental freedoms. The government should not have the power to close the bank accounts of Canadians on a whim. is doing this to save his own political skin but Mr. Speaker this is not a game it comes at the cost to Canadians rights and freedoms Speaker Parliament should not allow the Prime Minister to avoid responsibility in this way I urge all members of this house proceed with extreme caution now is the time to stand up for your constituents to show real leadership to help heal our divisions, to listen to those we disagree with, yeah. to not shut them down, to not tell them that they are irrelevant, to not speak insults to them. That is the job of each one of us as members of Parliament. No matter who we represent, we have to represent them with integrity, with hope, with honour. And what the Prime Minister is doing, Mr. Speaker, he has for the last two years disregarded these Canadians, called them names and insulted them. It is time to show leadership for every one of us and say no to this Emergencies Act. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Questions and comments? Question A, commentaire. The Honourable Member for Ottawa Centre. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Now, I will speak on behalf of my constituents, which all of you are sworn to do. I just ask the members opposite. If this kind of occupation was happening in their neighbourhoods, in their writings, for four weeks in a row, Order, 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 order. I just want to say the longer I get to stand here, the less option that people have to actually <laughs> present their feelings and, and their represent their constituents later on. We good? The Honourable Member of Ottawa Centre. Four weeks in a row, Speaker, and the members opposite talk about listening to the protesters. They won't even listen to a, and a member of this House right. to understand, Speaker, what my constituents, the members of my community, is going. And when did the line cross between being a lawful protest, which we welcome, actually, Speaker, in this writing, and we, happens all the time, to an illegal protest? Right. Members opposite were out there taking photos and encouraging those protesters to keep honking in the middle of the night. What the member now denounced those actions. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition.
opposition? That's a very good question for his leader, the Prime Minister. Who these, when these protests started, the first thing his, this Prime Minister did was call these people names. He insulted them. I don't think anyone in that member's constituency thinks that the answer for a Prime Minister to do, to the, the response for a Prime Minister to do is to hide and then hurl huge insults. Not just saying he disagrees with them, calling them misogynist, racist, their fringe view, they should not be tolerated. So very good question he should ask his own Prime Minister. Why didn't he take action? Why didn't he show leadership? Why didn't he, he take the high road and try to at least listen to these folks so that they felt that they were respected? Good question for your boss. Question and comment. Questions and comments. L'honorable député. The Honorable Member for La Prairie. Mr. Speaker, the problems in Alberta were resolved without the Emergencies Act. Uh, the same uh, Emerson and the Ambassador Bridge, uh, the situation resolved without the Emergencies Act. In Quebec, there were demonstrations. It was resolved without the Emergencies Act uh, in the Prime Minister's backyard here. There is an occupation. What did the Prime Minister do? First, he insulted them, and then he invoked the Emergencies Act. My question is simple. Between playing Pontius Pilate and the atomic bomb, there is tools that the Prime Minister could have used, like leadership. What does the Leader of the Opposition think of that? The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. I tell that member thank you for his question. He may recall I sent a letter very early on to the Prime Minister asking that he meet with the opposition leaders to talk about solutions, like the ones that he just spoke about. It's clear that the borders were cleared by police action, and that's a good thing. We believe that these protesters here in Ottawa, these blockades, could have been moved quickly had the Prime Minister shown some leadership, said, hey, I'm hearing you, I, I disagree with you, but I hear your concerns. We're going to look at removing these mandates. We're going to do it because it's actually scientific to remove them. I guarantee you, Mr. Speaker, that these folks would have moved on had the Prime Minister decided he wanted to actually listen. And what I promise you is we would not be here today invoking an Emergencies Act, which is a sledgehammer on all Canadians. Questions and comments? The Honourable Member for Burnaby South. It's no secret that the convoy stated their mission, which was to overthrow the government. It sounds ludicrous, but they brazenly posted that on their website, and they reiterated it. Order, order. I can't hear the question, and I'm sure the Leader of the Opposition can't hear the question. The Honourable Member for Burnaby South. It's no secret that the goal of this convoy, posted brazenly on their website, reiterated as recently as earlier this week in a press conference, was to overthrow a democratically elected government. That was their goal. So the leader, the interim leader of the Conservative Party says, we have heard you, we will keep standing up for you. Do you regret endorsing a convoy that is attacking the fundamental democracy of our country? Do you regret endorsing and supporting an occupation that has harassed citizens? Do you regret endorsing a movement which has lost... Uh, order, order, order. I, I mean, I, I know the questions have to come through the chair, and, and I, 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 I can't speak on behalf of the Leader of the Opposition, but I'll let the Leader of the Opposition answer, uh, answer the question. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. And obviously, nobody in this House uh, believes that a government should be overthrown. Although I have seen that members' colleagues had a number of pro communist marches, and so exactly. not sure if that means he endorses communism. Is when history looks back on this, conservatives will have stood up with Canadians, millions of Canadians, vaccinated Canadians, Canadians who are blue collar workers, Canadians who are white collar workers, Canadians who have had enough of a prime minister who has divided, wedged, stigmatized, and traumatized them. And the party that will have stood with that prime minister is that member and his NDP colleagues, and it's shameful. Reprise du débat, continuing debate, the Honourable Member for megantic Liable.
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I wish that I was rising here today to speak about uh, increased inflation. I wish I was here to uh, defend parents and seniors who have suffered greatly since the beginning of the pandemic and who today are dealing with all kinds of serious and grave situations. But because of this Prime Minister, because of his inaction, because he chose to protect his career instead of listening to Canadians, here we are today debating a bill which was invoked, it's been invoked for the first time since it was, since it was created in 88 by the Parliament. It's the Emergencies Act that I'm referring to, and obviously this will go down in history, Mr. Speaker, but not for the right reasons. And it's very disappointing, Mr. Speaker. The Prime Minister had to invoke this to manage the blockades, the protests in downtown Ottawa and uh, at Coots in Alberta, the uh, uh, cross-border uh, bridge in Emerson and uh, the Ambassador Bridge in, uh, uh, in Windsor. Colleagues, we have to remember these precedents. And we have to be very careful. However, there are only the blockades in Ottawa that remain. All the other blockades have been dismantled or are being dismantled without resorting to the Emergencies Act. For 13 days, the government took no significant measures to uh, appease these protests, did not uh, listen to the rumblings of discontent, the uh, fatigue and the demands of the protesters. He decided to go straight to the nuclear option. And so, Mr. Speaker, the Prime Minister simply did not respect the high threshold that is set out by the Emergencies Act to, dis to justify its invocation and its enforcement. And that's why, Mr. Speaker, the Conservatives are going to be voting against this, his decision. Resorting to the Emergencies Act is something that uh, it's one of the most important decisions a parliamentarian can make. The previous act, the War Measures Act, was only used three times during the First World War, the Second World War, and during the October Crisis in Quebec, and we remember that well. Mr. Speaker, it's our responsibility as parliamentarian, parliamentarians to protect democracy first and foremost. foremost. That includes the election of elected officials and the rights of citizens to not agree with the government. And they are right to be able to express that publicly, Mr. Speaker. These protests have created disturbances for many Canadians, especially people who live in Ottawa, for local businesses. It is very tough for them. They are collateral damage of a situation that goes well beyond Ottawa streets and Ottawa citizens. We all know that, Mr. Speaker. And as we've long said, the Conservatives are the party of uh, law and order. Illegal blockades must come down quickly and peacefully. Mr. Speaker, we have to calm things down, not only in Ottawa, but across the country. Unfortunately, as many experts have said, as many analysts have pointed out, the Prime Minister's actions will have the contrary effect, unfortunately. Let's go back to the beginning. How did all this start? Well, it started with a Prime Minister who chose to uh, turn an election into a political game. He called an election in the midst of a pandemic. And then he decided to uh, oblige Canadians to get vaccinated with no scientific proof that that was the right thing to do, Mr. Speaker. We asked him the question. We put the question to the government and to the Minister of Health. On what scientific basis are, are you, what, what scientific basis are you using to get truckers vaccinated to oblige this? But we never got an answer. But we didn't back down. They didn't back down. They maintained this uh, uh, obligation despite all the damage it caused to our economy, to the supply chain, and the scope of the ensuing movement that it created. When the protesters came to Ottawa, the Prime Minister hid. He hid out for an entire week, Mr. Speaker. And then he didn't try to calm things down. He just came out and insulted the protesters. He insulted Canadians who don't agree with him. That's what happened. 
He said that they were racists, misogynists, and he even said that their viewpoint was unacceptable. But we, all, we see that often in this House, Mr. Speaker. Every time we say something that the Prime Minister doesn't agree with, well, he goes straight to the unacceptable accusation. You know, over half of people in Canada, half of Canadians did not vote for him, and yet they're still Canadians. They're people who have the right to their opinions. They have spoken out, and they continue to have the right to do so. It is acceptable to vote against this Prime Minister, Mr. Speaker. I heard his viewpoints everywhere, in my writing, on social media, over the phone, in emails. All of us, we've gotten tons of emails this week. We've been swamped. People who are speaking out, but there are neighbors, there are voters, there are people who want to be heard, and they should be heard. But, you know, since the Prime Minister doesn't agree with them, Mr. Speaker, well, he doesn't like their opinion, so he decided simply to not listen to them. He's turned a deaf ear. Every time the Prime Minister has an opportunity, he stigmatizes Canadians. There was no representative from their association. He didn't discuss anything and the concerns with the, with the truckers. He didn't even apologize for his insults, that he's insulted all the protesters. And he's insulted people in this House, Mr. Speaker. You know, apologies from the Prime Minister, it's not for people. He, he, he doesn't give them to people who disagree with him. He heard that the crisis was getting worse, so he just stayed hidden. He could have intervened. He had a lot of tools at his disposal to intervene. The first tool is himself. You know, he's the head of state. He could have listened to Canadians. That is the very first thing that he should have done. That's the first option he should have used as head of state to choose to act. He should have act, acted like a statesman, but he didn't. So instead of listening, he decided to uh, give himself more powers. He decided to broaden the government's powers, Mr. Speaker. That is a bad decision. The Prime Minister's leadership is miserable. It's pathetic in this situation. And this week he even said invoking the Emergencies Act is never the first thing that the government should do. It shouldn't, it shouldn't be the second or the third option. It should be used with moderation and as a last resort, Mr. Speaker. That's what he said. No one thinks that the Prime Minister used any kind of first or second or third option or fourth option even. He has not succeeded in convincing anyone that it, that it is justified for him to resort to the Emergencies Act. Mr. Speaker, just about everyone, experts, police chiefs, analysts, everyone said that he had all the tools at his disposal, even the premiers. The premiers didn't want him to use the Emergencies Act. They've said it over and over. We can look after this. Do not throw oil on the fire. That's what they said. By invoking the Emergencies Act, that's what you're doing. That's what they told him, Mr. Speaker. How did the Prime Minister go, complete, go completely from ignoring the protesters and hiding to the nuclear option of adopting the Emergencies Act? We hope that history will tell us why this happened, because currently the Prime Ministers and his ministers are not telling us why, and currently the crisis that we're in has been directly created by the leadership void, the vacuum left by the Prime Minister. He could have used a reasonable approach. We said, we asked him, give us a plan, a plan to uh, announce uh, the withdrawal, the lifting of uh, obligatory vaccination and the lifting of health restrictions. And that's not unreasonable. All the provinces are doing it right now across the country. But unfortunately, this prime minister chose to put his head down, to do nothing, to not listen to the experts, to ignore them. And now he's wondering why the protesters and why Canadians are fed up with his lack of leadership. That's the reality that in which we find ourselves. The Prime Minister would rather do what he thinks is right and continues to refuse to give us a plan. 
Mr. Speaker, the government should not have the power to shut down Canadians' bank accounts. It should not have to resort to the Emergencies Act when there exist other tools to fix this type of crisis in Ottawa. The Prime Minister has failed miserably. And unfortunately, he will be judged not by us, but by the generations of Canadians to come. Thank you, Mr. Speaker.